everyone. Welcome to the fifth webinar for the Sustainable Cities MOOC. This week in the fifth module, we looked into understanding the importance of public health in cities and its accessibility to lower income communities. We also explored the role of education in a city's development, particularly how achieving the SDG in education can help build more sustainable cities. And today we will listen and interact with Susan Parnell. Sue is an urban geographer in the Department of Environmental and Geographical Sciences, Educational Sciences at the University of Cape Town and is one of the executives of the African Center for Cities at UCT. Sue has a prominent position with UCT leadership structures, serves on the board of several local NGOs concerned with poverty alleviation, sustainability, and gender equity, and is a regular keynote speaker and part of national and international advisory research panels. Please welcome Sue, and please feel free to write in your questions through, through thoughts or comments in the chat box. Sue, over to you, please. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Uh, very nice to connect uh, in, in various ways. Um, I've come to appreciate over time that this is actually an extremely special community. Every now and again, I bump into people and they say, hey, we were talking. We were, we were on Google Chat and we were on part of the, the MOOC in, in particular ways. Um, and because of that, and because I think that this represents a particularly good opportunity for us to share some collective wisdom. I'm going to start off, hopefully, by talking in a way that brings us together, not because I think that we will in 10 minutes agree on everything that has to happen in a city, or that, in fact, we will get even a common uh, way of talking about the problems but rather that I think it hopefully will bring us into a space where we can then have a bigger dialogue. So I'm going to switch um, from the picture of me, you'll be very relieved to know, uh, to go online. Can you, just checking that you can see me online. Hang on, I, might let me, I don't think I'm sharing my screen properly there. Um, hang on, am I sharing my screen? Not yet, it'll come. Um, So what I want us to be able to do is to, no, still not there. Hang on, it's coming. This is me being incompetent, not the screen being incompetent. So don't worry, we will resolve the problem. Just because I'm slow doesn't mean I never get there. That in fact, of course, is a, a general lesson. There you go, follow the instructions. Um, and we should get there soon. Um, I am hitting all the right buttons. I'm just hitting them in the wrong order. Bear with me, folks. What I'm, what I'm wanting to do is to talk quite generally about the idea of the fair city. Um, but there you go. Uh, we have practiced this. I was actually quite good at it last time. <laughs> um, why am I not managing to get up? I'm going screen share. Yes, yeah, Sue, I think you need to just get your presentation up. You, you just need to maximize your presentation screen, and that's what we'll see. Guys, if that's I can't right. do this, it's not the end of the world, but I should be able to, um, because there's more than enough for us to. Can you see me? Can you see me? Yes, that's, it. that's right. Excellent. Brilliant. OK. So the, just focus on this, this particular slide, because I just want to try and get us into the same frame of mind. I'm going to talk about the idea of a fair city. We could talk about a good city, a just city, the idea of the right to the city. We'll come back to all these kind of notions of a sort of utopian idea. But why I think it's a useful thing for us to talk about when we try to think of the human dimension. So that's what you were talking about when you are talking about health and education. In the city and the way that the city interacts on health and education. The way I think it's useful for us to do that is to talk about it in, in terms of, of, first of all, acknowledging that those kinds of ideas have got a normative position. In other words, there's a value base to them. That's what we mean by a normative position. 
but also that we're not just having a hypothetical or a theoretical or I hate it when they use the word academic in that sense, but in other words, a discussion about change that is never going to land in practice. I think what is fantastic about this community is that we have both scholars who are really interested in how things actually happen in practice, whether it's through an NGO, a CBO, or a government organization. But we also have practitioners who are wanting to kind of sit back and reflect a little bit more. And what thinking in a translational way does is that it enables us to integrate this into a single conversation. In other words, it's not an anti-theoretical idea or, or way of seeing things. Ideas really matter here, okay? They matter a lot. In other words, ideas shape practice and practice shapes ideas. But the idea of translational research actually comes out of some of the urban health work. It comes out of health work in general. And it's the idea that we think about research right from the way that we design the research concept through to how we apply it to how we assess it. And that helps us enormously. Are you worried that we're not online? Okay. Somebody will signal to me if we have a problem. Otherwise, I'm going to just continue. Okay, so I'm going to work from the assumption that everything that I'm saying and everything that you're going to ask questions about and talk to each other about is both significant in the realm of how we think, but also in the realm of what we do and how we act and what is put into practice in the physical form of the city. Okay, so let's turn our attention then to this idea of the uh, fair so city. I, yeah. So, hi, I'm so sorry to interrupt, but I think there is an no echo problem. problem. Uh, we just need a few minutes to uh, sort that out. Sure. Okay. There is some problem with the audio. Uh, right. Just, uh, just a moment, please. Okay. Other people don't have? Yes, Sue, please continue. Thank you. So sorry okay. to interrupt. No, no, no problem at all. Okay, guys, so so we're working from in this kind of translational mode of working, but we're going to look at the idea of the fair city. Now, I don't want to pretend that we all see things the same way because for some people, justice is about creating a level playing field. In other words, putting everybody, giving everybody the same education or the same whatever it is, health, inheritance, uh, the benefits which make being in a city better or worse for people. But for other people, the idea of fairness is actually a much more um, active act of redistribution uh, where you may need to, in fact, give significant advantage to some over the others. And that diagram and that, that, that cartoon is, is a very good illustration of that. And in truth, most of us kind of wobble between the two, uh, but there are definitely two poles of that. And you begin to see that the devil is always in the detail. And we see that when we start to think about what kinds of programs should we put in place in the city? How does social policy actually work out? Should we be paying for the, all the train fares in order to get people to hospital? Or do we just need to make sure that hospitals are free for everybody? Or do we need to make sure that there's a sliding scale for hospitals in the city because wages are so unequal? So the devil is in the detail, okay? But I want us to try and think more generally about the idea of fairness. And as I say, it's not clear that we all mean the same thing. And, and that's really tricky. And one of the most difficult things, I think, when we start to talk about public policy, which is what, or social policy, which is what we're talking about today, in an urban context, is that cities by their nature have lock-in. In other words, things land up affecting not just this generation, but many generations to come. So if you take my example of how do you get to the hospital, whether or not we have put in a public transport route that actually really reaches the places that the poor need to get to, will have an implication not just for this generation, but also for the next generation. So who pays for that, how much they pay, uh, 
will land up being an intergenerational thing. And I love that photograph because it's of me and my mum and my gran. And the reason that I use it is that I am now an exceptionally privileged person. Ironically and very sadly, because much of my benefit came from the fact that I grew up as a white person in South Africa, which meant that I got, because of when I was born in 1960, many of the advantages of a disadvantageous system. Made it much more fair for me, because as it happens, I went from being very working class to being able to access higher education, uh, good schooling, good healthcare, etc. But my gran, who you see there, grew up in England as a working class person in England. There were no pensions, there was no free healthcare. She was a woman, she couldn't work. And so, partly because my mother migrated, there was an intergenerational shift. Now, whether that was good, bad, and fair for everybody, we know is a much bigger story and a much more complicated story. But it points to the fact that whatever we do in one generation will have implications for other generations. And so the way we think, when we begin to start to think about the city and public services and social benefits and safety nets in an urban context, I want to provoke you to think about, would you think about it differently if the person who you were trying to improve things for hadn't yet been born, okay? Just so it's a very useful way to think about it. And similarly, if you think about your own life, how, and perhaps those of people around you, how have their life chances or your life chances been distorted, either positively or negatively, by what happened before, okay? So this idea of fairness and urban fairness is one that has a longitudinal dynamic to it. We also know that it's got to be, to be really fair, things have got to actually be the same whether you're talking about Bangalore, Cape Town, Bogota, or Berlin, okay? And actually we know that your chances of having access to equal opportunities, if you were born in Kinsh and live in Kinshasa in the DRC Congo, are really not the same as if you live in Cologne in Germany, okay? And that, that's really awkward for us as we begin to start to think about what fairness means. Okay, so just want to problematize that for you and to get us to start kind of being mentally agile as we think about this. In other words, yes, there are big differences. We've got different ideological positions, there are different scales, there's different temporalities, there are different realities. Nevertheless, as an urban specialist, there are some common problems. And it seems to me that one of the things which is, particularly for those of you who see yourselves as first and foremost people who are interested in the human dimension of sustainability, rather than perhaps the environmental or the economic dimension, there are actually some common or some really big things that we need to think about, which are true whether you're talking about Oslo, this incredibly rich you know, place, or, or whether you're talking about Kisimu, a much, much poorer place in, in Kenya. Okay, and they really do hinge on two things, it seems to me. One is how do we mitigate or reduce the inequality? In other words, how do we prevent inequality because of the way we build, design, manage cities? And then when we experience and we identify inequality, which typically comes from cities, because don't forget cities are places that concentrate wealth. They concentrate inequality. They concentrate mobility. Okay. When those patterns become entrenched and get faster and faster, because the value of land goes up, because wages are so you know, divergent, what then can we do in order to mitigate that? And that might be within a city or it might be between cities. Okay. And those are the kinds of questions that you're going to have to be able to think about and to answer. Now, the tricky part is, is that there's no shortage of people thinking in utopian kinds of terms. And that's how I put there, you know, the right to the city, the good city. Um, and you'll see right at the beginning on the very first slide that I put up, there was a, a link to a free book, free downloadable book, which has got much of the text here. And you can read a bit more about that stuff uh, if you're wanting to. And what I don't want to spend the rest of our time talking about is the idea that we've 
perhaps got a very limited, distorted understanding. Because in a way, it's quite easy to have cheap shots about, oh, we don't know what we're doing. We don't, it's an imperfect ideal. You know, we haven't done enough on this. What I want us to do instead is to focus on where the innovation is at the moment, okay? Knowing that it's not perfect, knowing that our idea of fairness is distorted, contested, and limited. Nonetheless, what are the things which people have begun to start saying, hey, that's interesting, that's really exciting, okay? If we pursue these kinds of lines, then we might actually begin to get there. And there are two things I think are very high, just at a very high level that are helpful. One is the idea of urban transformation. In other words, that cities can be places where we change society. That society can be changed through the way we run and design and manage our cities. Okay, so cities are, are spaces of innovation. Okay, so that's the first thing. Innovation, not just to make money, okay, but potentially also to really get to grips with what protection actually means. And if some of you I'm hoping will have come from places like Mexico or Brazil or India even actually, South Africa certainly, because it's in cities that some of the most interesting advances in social protection have taken place. Okay, And that's true whether we talk about public health, whether we talk about uh, universal um, coverage of social protection, things like pension, whether it's on things like basic health and safety and access to healthcare. Um, so cities can be sites of innovation. That's the first thing. And then the second thing that people have begun to say really relatively recently is that on the back of a whole lot of, and some of you will be more familiar with these ideas than others, on the back of, of what's known as complex systems thinking, the recognition that what you do in one domain has a knock-on impact on the other is now much, much more widely accepted. Okay, so to go back to your health example, the idea that you can actually improve health, not by biomedical interventions, you know, not just by handing out antibiotics or giving um, maternal title, maternal health improvements, but that you could also improve health simply by making cities walkable or safe. Um, that kind of systems thinking is, is relatively new, okay? And what that's doing, and we could have drawn this thing in, in any way, is that it means that although there is still a lot of room for specific expertise and particular interventions, okay, actually people are beginning to say, you can't just introduce a scheme for the improvement of education and that will save your city, okay? The recognition is that you need to be ensuring that at the same time as you improve education, you are also ensuring that families have got access to sanitation, clean water, electricity, so that they can study at night. So it's the entire system and the way that the urban system comes together that has the potential to really advance human well-being in an exponential kind of way, okay? So it's not about saying unless you do everything, nothing will happen, but it is about saying we need to realize that there are potential synergies, that there are catalytic effects, and when we understand the relationship between particular interventions, then we will do much better. So the health people used to do this years ago. They, they realized long ago that if you put a focus on, on um, educating women, health would improve, okay? So it wasn't an, it was a, a, a multi-sectoral uh, intervention in that way. And so this idea of the nexus uh, is important there. And so I'm gonna try and wind up fairly soon, but what I wanted to be able to try and point to you is to say, when you start to think about the fair city, the tension is to think about this in lots of ways, um, that are across different sectors in particular ways. Okay, so that's complicated in the global south and I'm gonna leave that aside simply to say, and you can you, these will be there for you later on, is that in the global south, actually doing this complicated stuff is even more difficult than it is anywhere else. Not only have you got less money, but you've also got 
not such strong states. And so typically lots of people have to be involved in that process, civil society, faith-based organizations, just a whole lot of those kinds of people have to be able to come together. And so it's a more complicated negotiation to understand those relationships. Nonetheless, it is possible to expand, and we have seen a dramatic expansion in the protection of people in an urban context. And I want to just be very clear as I end this, this is my last slide. The expansion of urban welfare, by which I mean things like improvement in the conditions of informal workers, um, some social protection in the sense of access to cheaper um, services like power and water, ideally some basic health care. In middle-income countries, increasingly that's about um, access to, to free or subsidized health care. What we do not mean by urban welfare is what the poor do for themselves. Okay? In other words, when nobody does things for poor people, they have to do it for themselves. And self-organization for social protection is not necessarily a bad thing. And in fact, thank goodness, we do see widespread mobilization. But the idea that the poor should be obliged to look after themselves, that they them should have to pay for their own protection, is not what is typically meant by the fair city. And so putting in place the mechanisms that will ensure participatory democracy, access to electoral uh, rights, the right to vote, the access to justice, as well as rights to services, is something that is done for the poor, not something that the poor have to do for themselves. And the difficulty with that is that that raises lots of political details and lots of political questions. And so I'm going to leave it at that and let's open up for some questions um, and take your reflections on it. We can also pick up on uh, a whole lot of those things later on um, and, and see from there. Okay, so I think we'll wait for some queries from you. Um, if there are particular things you want to pick up on, or if there are um, more general things that you want me to expand on. Otherwise, and feel free to come back to each other um, to counter the points that are being made. Yeah, so uh, Nicole is talking about the, uh, the question of jobs um, and saying, and picking up on that intergenerational question, that the kinds of jobs that we have now is potentially inconceivable that our parents would have been, had thought that they would have, be able to do. Uh, and Nicole, I'm assuming by that, that you're referring to the fact that jobs today and in the last decade have tended to be, even in the global south, the jobs which have expanded and have been real jobs in the sense that they have full-time wages have tended to depend on literacy and numeracy. Of course, that isn't where the bulk of the expansion of jobs has been because, in fact, levels of education have been so poor that in the Global South, actually, sadly, most of the jobs that have been on the rise have been informal jobs, um, where entry level is, um, in terms of education and, and networks, is very, very much lower. Looking forward, though, the big anxiety, as you know, is about what automation means. Okay, and this is not something that is just going to affect New York and Tokyo um, or London, where they are extremely anxious about the number of jobs that are going to be lost. Uh, we begin to start thinking about the countries that have benefited immeasurably from the rise of clerical jobs, from the rise of the service sector, and we start to think about what computerization and automation means for those jobs and what it means for the organization of the city, we do. We have to start to think about the kind of education system and the, the, the issue of transferable skills. So really important question. And just to say, Nicole, fundamental to start off with the question of work. Uh, what is really interesting about the discussion about the right to the city um, is that unfortunately it's been uncoupled from the discussion of the right to work. Um, perhaps one of the most fundamental rights. So yeah, maybe you want to give us an example of that. Uh, yes, so for the, for the next question, uh, Nikki would like to know, there seems to be a relationship between the fair city and smart city. How do you see the smart city supporting the fair city vision? Yeah. 
So there's a relationship between the smart cities and I didn't get the, the rest of the question. There's a relationship between the smart city and the fair city. And how will the smart city innovation support the Yeah. Okay. Uh, very good question. And for many of us in practice, really, really important. Um, as you know, there are big criticisms of smart cities, um, which are seen by many to be elitist. They are seen by many to be serving the interests of industry um, who are innovating and introducing computerized packages uh, to make cities more efficient rather than to make them more fair. Now, that may be happening, and we know that it is, and it's a, a reasonable critique, but it absolutely doesn't have to be. There is no necessary correlation between technology, which is what a smart city is about, about the ability uh, to use computerized forms of knowledge in different ways and the kinds of normative bases and outcomes that we would want to be putting in place in the city. The problem for us as planners and urbanists is that what we've absolutely got to get our heads around is how do you use smart data, smart technology, smart ways of operating in order to advance the interests of the poor more rapidly than you do those of the rich. Okay. Um, and what for me is really fascinating is when you look at the urban studies literature, almost everybody spends their time thinking about what's wrong with smart cities. And what we haven't seen nearly enough of is intellectual innovation to talk about how do you introduce a universal grant? How do you make a payment? Um, of a basic income grant to people? How do you ensure that the costing and modeling is done so that you can achieve redistribution? These are really important things that smart cities could deliver. We just have to set the normative agenda. So I think the idea, you know, smart cities do mean different things to different people. And sometimes it is purely an ideological signal. But the idea that technology has to deliver to the rich, not the poor, I would absolutely contest. And we should be fighting back. Thanks, Sue. Uh, we take the next, quest next question. So next question uh, is, if developing countries in the global south are always depending on those in the north for financial help to resolve their problems, how will they ever have fair cities? Yeah. <laughs> Look, I think we have, there are some very real, I don't want to underestimate the validity of that statement or the scale of the structural impediments. Um, and that, but I do want to point to one thing that helps us. One of the reasons why healthcare has been so difficult in the global south is that we've relied very heavily on a biomedical form of healthcare, and that is dominated by the farmers, the big pharmaceutical companies, okay? So we allow people to get sick, and then we treat them. Whereas, if you think about the origins of public health, which came from cities, it started with questions like, how do we make clean water and sanitation? How do we reduce densities? How do we ensure walkability? How do we protect people from an exposure to environmental health? Now, those considerations are actually very easy to control locally. And it seems to me that by shifting the public health discourse from one which is only about infectious diseases, okay? Infectious diseases are really important, but it's not only about that. If we can shift it away from infectious diseases, that will help. That's the first thing. And I think the second thing that actually potentially helps is the recognition in the global north that there are limits to antibiotics. And that because we live in such a connected world, an outbreak of disease in a relatively remote part of Ethiopia can within 12 hours be in the heart of Washington DC. And when people begin to start realizing that, and that's what's behind Gates, who you may have seen has just put a whole lot of money into this idea of big new pandemics, once people begin to see that they live in a connected urban world, 
then the healthcare model that gets put in place to protect the rich is one that at least is potentially more advantageous uh, to the poor and to poorer parts of the world. So, but my, I don't think we should be waiting for new antibiotics. I don't think we should be waiting to bypass the farmers with licenses. I think we should be starting with some of the ABCs of public health, which actually have to do with things like, what's the drainage system like? Do we understand the importance of clean water? How do we actually get rid of the waste? Have we got a system in place? That we can do. We don't need anybody. We don't even need particularly big money in order to be able to do that. That can be done locally. Thanks, Sue. So Deepa from India raises a very important issue. He says that in India, decades of caste domination was countered by the constitution of the independent nation, and subsequently reservations for the marginalized or the backward classes was established. But of late, the same laws have been politicized to give them more benefits, even with respect to jobs, which is threatening to some of the remaining population who fall outside the benefit. My question is, is a measure like reservation a positive step towards creating a more fair and equitable society? You're talking from an Indian context. I'm talking yes. from a South African context. We have exactly the same issue. And, and frankly, we probably do in a whole lot of other places as well. We, the debates about gender equity are as pertinent today in places like Holland as they were some time ago. Um, and I mean, I think what for me is, is really significant about this is, is that societies change, okay? And they generally change with some conflict. Um, and they often change because really powerful people try to entrench their power in even more important kinds of ways. So if I take the South African case, we've had both of those things. We've had real opposition to vested interests where a racial minority were destabilized, pushed out. Um, and it's absolutely clear that that was the right thing to happen in a grand scheme of things. Absolutely, not even in a grand scheme of things, in an absolute scheme of things. Did that feel comfortable for every single individual? No, not necessarily. And so I think that there were group tensions and individual tensions. Um, and is it exactly the same 25 years after the end of apartheid as it was then? No, possibly not. Does that mean that we've clearly got new forms of elite power, some of which are racialized, some of which continue to be racialized, and some of which are new forms of power? So. I just, it's a much longer question, but what I would flag for us as urbanists is to acknowledge that whoever does have power at any particular point typically benefits from their position in the city. Okay, so give an example of that. As a white South African, not only were you so-called, were you richer than so-called black South Africans, but you were also able to buy property. That property lands up having some kind of growth in its value. You have an inheritance. It goes to the next generation. So it's that intergenerational stuff that I was trying to kind of point to earlier. And so I think when we think about the affirmative action kinds of questions, which are always messy, never very effectively applied, elites almost always capture them. I hope you know what I mean by elite capture, where some people manage to get more out of a redistribution system than others. Some elite people often manage to kind of turn something to their own interests. So we have to be very vigilant and we have to hold those people to account. Very clear to me, racial privilege in South Africa continues. Is it the only form of privilege? No. Okay. Are there real tensions associated with affirmative action? Absolutely, yes. Was it the right thing to do? Absolutely. We would never have begun to transform the city if we hadn't. So I just think you want to think about it in, in quite complex kinds of ways. And best of all, try and imagine whenever you do it, I find it very helpful to imagine that I'm a black man, not a white woman. In other words, just change my headspace so that I don't think about it from my point of view. Uh, 
uh, and I find that that's really helpful um, in understanding the problem. I don't know if that makes any sense to people, but yeah. Thanks, Sue. So uh, Nicole here, I think, would just like a little bit of peek in the future. What she says is, just like 20 years back, it was impossible to imagine some of the current jobs that we have now. Similarly, the jobs that our children will take up 20 years later are not conceivable now. But how do we know that the education system is preparing them to be ready for the future jobs? We don't, OK? <laughs> we absolutely don't. But what we do know is that the better we educate them, and the stronger and the more flexible their skills, and the stronger and the more flexible the cities are that they live in, the better that they will be able to adapt. The worst thing that we can give to our children is a city that is very rigid, that doesn't allow for mobility in social position, in job change, uh, and an education system that locks people in. So I think one of the things that's turned out to be fantastically useful about the rise of interest in cities is that what it does do is that it brings into that nexus relationship, that complex systems thinking I was telling you about, helps to prepare people to think differently and to reimagine and to recreate. What we do know is that there will be cities, we do know there will be jobs, and we do know that we're gonna need livelihoods. So, you know, we probably need to know more about our history so that when we begin to start to change things, as we must do, we will change the right things and we won't remove the things which are important. So, yeah, that would be my uh, way of responding to that. And perhaps to think about what it means for us collectively. So I think one of the difficulties when we think about jobs and skills is we tend to think about children in individual ways. We tend to think about how do they personally advance? rather than what we should be thinking about, which is if you are running a city of five or 10 million people, or one million people, what will the change in job structure imply? Um, and it seems to me that as leaders, it's the onus is on us to think about the collective implications of change. They didn't know that there was going to be, that there were going to be computers. They didn't know that there was going to be an industrial revolution. You know, they managed that transition. We'll manage it. The question is whose interests will be served in the process and are our cities fit to purpose to make that change okay great thank you uh, so uh, sabrina would like to know most infrastructure development programs cite service charges or customer charges as a major source for their operation and maintenance of the in the lifetime cost of the project in the concept of fair cities, one of the things that we have to harp on is access to basic services as an equal right, equally to everyone. And in a country like India, we are trying to provide access to basic services, but this is a major cost which is considered in that. But also the problem is a major chunk of the population may not be able to spare even the basic amount for these service charges. So how can the, model, the models of these projects be recast to make their operation more viable in the long run and also be a very positive and strong step towards creating fair cities? It's, it's the question of the day. Um, and <laughs> it, in a way, it goes back to the discussion we were having about the, the smart cities ad agenda. So how we finance large, long-term infrastructure projects is very different in places where we have lots of information about them, where the ratings agencies tell us that people will be able to afford to pay, where the banks agree that the institution is fundable, where the country is fundable. It gets much more expensive and much more difficult in places about which we know very little, who have no record of borrowing, um, and where their national governments won't stand surety for them. So there are lots of things that have to change. But the thing that I'm reminded of most often is that the assumption that people will struggle to pay for their services and therefore we shouldn't provide infrastructure is transparently stupid when we realize that poor people are actually paying more for their services now than they would if they were provided if, at some scale on the back of large scale infrastructure. 
Um, and there are plenty of people who are making a lot of money. It's not as if people are not consuming water and not consuming energy and not getting on a transport. So if you get into any poor city, certainly in an African context that I know better than the Asian context, it's not like nothing's happening. There are plenty of people getting around there and doing their business. And so I think some of it is around making things more legible, um, perhaps assisting even in, in ensuring that, that investors like long-term pension funds are able to feel more secure that there will be a return and shifting that terrain so that we are able to target the money where it needs to go instead of rebuilding supermarkets with three sets of marble instead of one in Baltimore, whatever it is that we're doing with money instead. So I'm not suggesting that we will overcome that prejudice easily, um, nor in fact that we necessarily have to change international investors. Again, I think quite often, particularly in large countries in the global south, our governments have actually got plenty of money. So if I take the South African case as an example, our government has plenty of money to make those large scale investments in poor municipalities and it doesn't. We have to hold them to account. Uh, so some of that is about shifting the relationship between the national and the local on what is necessary by way of urban infrastructure. Well, and shifting the logic that it's residents who have to pay. Yeah, here's hoping. <laughs> I'm sorry, did, did I interrupt you? No, no, no. Uh, okay, so the next question is from Nepal and Rabindra Raj says that in 2002, he worked in an NGO to help the street and slum children to get education, health and shelter. They picked up children from streets, slums and homeless people and they helped them to provide food, clothes, housing, education. But during the program, evidence collected showed that they were not interested in ed education and rather enjoyed being in the street even though they did not have food, shelter, or clothes there. And this was being uh, leveraged by criminals who would use them for uh, activities like drug supply or prostitution. So what his concern is that here we are addressing a basic problem of a will to change or the notion that there can be a better life. And if this is the main problem, then how can we improve human development in cities by battling this? Um. It's a nuanced question, and, and I like those questions because it reminds us that the answers are not always simple. Um, in other words, um, you point, for example, to the realities of crime on the street, to the presence of um, dysfunctional antisocial interests. So this naive idea that the poor are always completely benign, that the homeless um, are there because something has happened to them, that there is no malevolent intent of anybody operating on the streets, I think is something that we have to actually confront. The idea, particularly in, in cities of the global south, though, that people choose to be on the streets, I think is one that is transparently wrong and naive. Um, I think it's a much more complicated question in the global north. Um, or was, uh, their social protection has broken down to such a, an extent that I think increasingly people who uh, would choose not to be on the streets and homeless um, are there. Um, so it's a, it's a sophisticated domain. I mean, the, the challenge, my challenge back to you would be to say, assuming you were able to tell, would you have a solution for people who didn't want to be on the streets? And I think that, and, and have all of those opportunities been used up? Because until such time, there's still so much to do. Um, I'm inclined to think that we have to be careful, watch our backs, um, and not have an antagonistic relationship with crime prevention services, health and safety, um, and to be fairly realistic about the dark as well as the light side uh, of poverty relief. But Social workers are rather underrated, I think, in, in the urban space. Police officers are underrated. Um, and we have to remember that they form an absolutely fundamental part of providing a social safety net uh, in the city. And that's partly because they are there to identify uh, 
criminals. They are there to enforce. And we can't pretend that those are dimensions of urban life that we can do without. So I suppose that would be my, my somewhat simplistic uh, response to you would be to say, can we validate um, and then ensure that those preventative actions happen alongside facilitative ones, like ensuring that there are other opportunities, that there are education programs, that there is an aftercare facility, that there are schools that people can go to, that there is a soup kitchen, um, so that it's not either or. Uh, so, Veena Priya would like to know, providing infrastructure and housing for the urban poor would just involve building more housing, more land, and which often also leads to a major deforestation. That's something we are facing here in India a lot. But then she says, in the approach to this development, what is the trade-off in this scenario? Where do we draw the line? There was a delightful graphic circulating uh, on social media a little while ago um, about the relationship between, um, it was the first time I'd ever seen it in a single diagram. Um, and the title of the graphic was The Importance of a Shing Single Child Policy in the Global North. Um, and, the re and what it was pointing to was the level of consumption uh, and of emissions, and it gave the figures for North America, which were like four times that of Sweden, which were in turn, you know, 20 times that of India. Um, so what I'm pointing to is the, the, the substantive issues of consumption and of demographics, um, and the way that those two things are intertwined. And of course, the consumption question is also associated absolutely fundamentally with our understanding of what we need. No, what what is and that's generally not about the poor. Um, and again, I use a South African example. Whenever we look at how much land is consumed by new housing construction, the land that is consumed by the elite outstrips that of many, 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 many more pe poor people because rich people use lots and lots of stuff, and they build big houses, and then they need cars and roads and all the things that consume natural resources. So um, it's it goes back to the density stuff, but I think for me it's much more fundamentally about that, that interplay between how many people, um, the difficult thing for us to talk about, you know, can we really need 11 million people? Um, and how much do those 11 million people each need to have? And can we make it a bit fairer between us, please? A few less northern consumers. Great. <laughs> Yeah, Sorry. Uh, yeah. So this one draws inspiration from uh, closer home. So Joseph asked, slums are probably the biggest symbols of inequality in a city, but what would be the starting point? Where do we begin empowering these inhabitants or the inhabitants? Like, for example, the Fefanati project in Durban, I'm, I'm, I hope I got the name right, where the informal traders were empowered and they also helped, they were also helped to access more safe work environment. So Joseph, I'm very pleased you gave that example because at the start of your question, I was going to say, I have to say I don't see so-called slums as the worst aspect of urban life. For me, the worst aspect of urban life is the fact that people don't have jobs because for two reasons. One, one is that if you have a job, you can sort out where you live and what you're able to do in, in all sorts of ways. And also when I go into so-called slums, I find people actually are very creative, they are very industrious, and generally the conditions under which they live improve over time. Um, in other words, they make slow investments and the worse the economy, the slower the investment. But it's not a space of no hope for me. But when I see somebody who's sitting on the side of the road for day after day after day, I find it, it, it is dehumanizing, it is undermining it, and that leaves me without hope. So, so for me, the symbol of hope is, not the, is, is the slum. The symbol of, uh, of despair is, is unemployment. Um, and I would go back to some of the stuff on health and education because you can't learn, you can't go to school, you can't get a job 
um, that's the cycle that we have to actually break. Um, houses will sort themselves out. Infrastructure but, doesn't always, but that's a different story. Um, well, so we've been getting messages uh, on the chat that people are really grateful to you and they're, they're loving the session. They're really grateful to you for your opinion. And, you know, it's, it's just a new way of how to look at things. And, and I think that's something we're all taking in right here, right now. Uh, now, moving on to the next question. So uh, this is also a bit of a trade-off question. And uh, the guy wants to uh, uh, hear, he wants to know that uh, while sanitation system is a persistent problem, in the cities in, across the world, and it affects uh, whether it's human health or food security. But the wastewater treatment in cities would also have an impact on the agricultural um, aspects, which are right outside the city, in the fringes or in the rural areas. So, how can the cities be incentivized further the sanitation system and they're sensitive to this aspect of the particular trade off that they have between the rural areas and the cities? Well, I'm, I don't know if you can see where I'm sitting, but I'm sitting in Cape Town. And I, some of you may know that we have just had an absolutely terrible, terrible drought. So different versions of how bad it is, but and was it a political crisis? But what is very clear is that we have had the lowest rainfall we've had for 300 years. And what that means is that there was a real trade-off between where the water went. Did it go to agriculture outside of the city to produce our food, or did it come into the city to flush our toilets. Um, and I just, that would be the, so to go very directly to that. Um, and it goes back to that question about consumption. You know, do we have to have globally, we need safe sanitation, absolutely. And it's probably, that is the Cinderella of infrastructure. But do we need to be flushing potable water down toilets in every single city when we're sitting with 6 billion people flushing the loo, how many times a day? So it seems to me that that's one very important place to start. Um, I go back to my the question about consumption. What do you eat? Turns out to make a huge amount of difference to how much you need from the agricultural sector. How many liters of water are you wasting when you throw away rotten fruit that you bought from the supermarket all wrapped up in plastic? And how many people's mouths are you serving? Um, you know, they're interconnected questions, but they speak to our central identity of who are we? And what do we want? And what do we expect? And what do we deserve? Uh, what, do, what are we entitled to? And what do we owe? Um, and once I think we begin to start thinking about in those sorts of terms, it begins to be a bit easier, even if it's not very comfortable. I know when I look at my own life and I say, look at what's thrown out and I do the, the water audit, not, not the food audit, the water audit on what it, it costs uh, to produce those extra carrots that I didn't use and that extra piece of meat that I threw away because I hadn't eaten it in time. Then I understand the agricultural issue much, more, much, much, much more directly. Uh, I think people heard you when you were saying that our governments have enough money to fund the projects and, you know, we can, we have enough to financial resources to take care of the projects and that made them think, huh, who else has money? So the next two questions that we have, I'm going to just club it for you, is how can we incentivize or involve the private companies, the major uh, financial uh, you know, behemoths that are there in our cities, in our country, to throw their economic and financial power behind developing these cities so that you know they also appreciate the fair city as a benefit for them as, as their market and their consumers growing and rather not see it as a way in which diminishes their power or their hold. Yeah. Look, you know, there's huge, nation states have huge power um, and, it, and it's sometimes regulations that we don't even begin to understand. So I, these are two fiscal things that they could easily do. One is they can change the regulations on what pension funds have to invest in, okay? Um, because it's long-term, low-risk money and ensuring that it goes into public investment in your own national context. So if you are a government pension fund, it seems to me ridiculous that you can't be forced to spend your money in your own national context on your own residential population. So that's a regulatory change. But then there are much, much smaller regulatory changes that you could also make. So, so for example, there's a fantastic organization in South Africa called the Water Research Commission. And for every liter of water that is used in South Africa, 
we are levied, we don't even know we are levied it. It's something like 0.02% on every liter. It's a tiny, tiny fraction. That money goes into doing research on how to sustain the sector. Now, if you think about it, you could do exactly the same thing on a petrol levy for transport research, a cement levy for housing research, um, a, a computer levy for IT, for public good investment. Uh, you know, it, it's not difficult stuff to think about. It just requires a public will and a political will to put it in place to ensure that we take control of our own institutions. So, you know, I mean, I think that there's a, a particularly for those of us in the global south, this idea that we, we simply have not built the institutions and the mechanisms that ensure that we give attention to these fundamental kinds of questions. Um, and so we bleed our most intelligent, most sophisticated researchers either to other parts of the world or to the private sector. And then we, when we have got clever, smart people wanting to look at what it means to make a healthy city, we've got no money for them to do research, but we've got money to be doing all sorts of other kinds of things. So it's, it's, uh, we have to take back control. Um, and some of that it goes to that question earlier about kind of what kinds of jobs and what's the impact of job change. That's ours to decide. You know, we could, we could regulate. We don't have to have all of those things. We could innovate. We can do all sorts of things. But we do need to give it conscious thought. <laughs> and sometimes that needs some money. But as I, say, I don't think that the, the barrier is actually fiscal. Okay. <laughs> Okay. This is the last question. This is the last question. question. For this and uh, Camilla asks, and, uh, Camilla do you think decentralized asks, national health insurance, health insurance, insurance, health insurance, insurance, insurance is a way to tackle inequity in access, access to health services? UK has the NHS, has which is still the problematic NHS, and stuttering because of lack of staff and doom. Now, what could be the scenario in the low-income countries where governments do not have the capacity to provide it, but would want to aim at Aim at initiative. Initiative. Yeah. Um, Camilla, you, you're taking me beyond my comfort zone. And I would, but what I do know is that this is a very live debate in South Africa and it's quite well written up. So it, I'm sure it is in other places too, but there's a very active discussion about the introduction of a national health system. Um, and they on both the left and the right, there are people who are in favor and against. So it's it's not a simple divide um, of people who are on the left saying it's good and people on the right saying it's bad. So you might want to have a look at that and we can put you in contact with people on that debate. And I'm sure it happens elsewhere. What I can tell you, though, is in the post-1994 period in South Africa, there was a much less ambitious version of that that has made a fundamental difference. Um, which was to introduce free health care for children under six and to introduce free child and maternal health. Um, the difficulty in South Africa, as many middle-income countries, is that effectively what we have is a two-tier system, where we have a private medical system for the elite and we have a public medical system uh, for the bulk of the population. Um, and the resolution of those two systems is what I think is the real difficulty. And what the NHS managed to do, at least in the early years, although that is now being eroded uh, through privatization and neoliberalism, is that the elite also bought into it. And I think that's one of the things which we're not used to thinking about. Okay, And, and I suppose this is a nice note for us to end on. You have to make universal benefits work for everybody. Okay. That means they've got to work for everybody. And if you don't ensure the participation of the rich and the buy-in of the rich, they will white ant it and you will lose it all. So it's difficult, but you have to think about it very strategically. Um, and that, and is, the that is the challenge of cities. Of cities. That's, that's where the where really need 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 the poorest, where the poorest where the poorest doesn't concentrate. Uh, and the uh, challenge is to, to, to capture them both. Capture them both. So, so. Uh, Thanks a lot. So, so I think um, this brings us to the end of our session and I will have to take time to convey a few messages that have been sent out to us. Uh, so, I mean, we know that our course is, this is this 
a lot of people who are taking up our professionals from all various aspects of the society. We have teachers, we have caregivers, we have professionals, we have any kind of professionals we can think of. And at the end of the session, they, they can just they're just overwhelmed as to how to how they have learned to think about certain aspects and certain problems which probably bother them every day. I mean, talking about a sustainable city is definitely one thing, but to be able to be sensitive and approach the in problem solving manner is something that they have found today yeah. and they loved it. And thank you so much, Sue. Thank you everyone for Practice. participating in this webinar. It was great. And thank you all for your insightful questions. And thank you again for taking time out for this. And we will see you again in the next webinar. Uh, we call it for today. Thanks a lot. Goodbye. Good. Bye-bye, everybody. Thank you. And yeah. yeah. All the best.